Have you ever wondered how you can market or promote a project or a business that you're trying to start? That's what we'll talk about today. Marketing is really just about sharing your passion. Michael Hyatt. Today, we're going to talk about the book, The One Page Marketing Plan Get New Customers, Make More Money, and Stand Out from the Crowd by Alan Dibb. This is a pretty popular book because what it does is it simplifies marketing for mere mortals. I don't really know how to market, so I thought it would be interesting to try to learn a little bit about how I could do better, but just so I could get more people listening to the podcast. Someone asked a question on a podcast last week, asking the question if the one-page marketing plan is still good enough. And I wanted to find that out, I guess, for myself. Do I need a complicated marketing system in place in order to have a plan about how to even market this podcast? He says that part of the problem why you want to do marketing just in general is that you want more business. You want to make more money. And he quotes the Zig Ziglar quote, money isn't everything, but it ranks right up there with oxygen. He really believes that when you make money within your business or whatever project you're working at, it makes it better. Because first of all, it will solve problems for you. It'll also solve problems for other people, whether you're able to donate money, whether you're able to support other people, even if you're just doing a hobby. The other part that he talks about is that when people tend to leave their jobs and create their own business, part of the problem is, is they just become the same bad boss they had. And you really want to think about how you can do things differently. And the only way that he feels that you can have a marketing plan, plan to make your business grow, is to have a plan. Doctors follow treatment plans and pilots follow plans. And everyone who is successful in what they're doing has a plan. And a lot of times, though, when you have a business and you're thinking about the fact that you want to market your podcast, maybe you want to write a book or start a small business, you don't have a plan. You think, well, you know, maybe I'd buy an advertisement. I'll tell people. I'll say, listen to my podcast, subscribe and tell a friend. That's a marketing plan. That's my marketing plan. And it's okay, but it's not fantastic. And that's why I thought the book would help me in creating that plan. When you're doing marketing just in general, a very small amount of your effort is actually going to do the best work. It's that Pareto plan, right? 80-20 rule that 80% of your success will come from 20% of your work. And what happens if you do start a business and it starts to fail is then you start panicking and you just start throwing money out there. I'm going to buy ads. I'm going to do this symposium. I'm going to speak at this event. I'm going to do everything I possibly can. When in reality, it's the smart things you can do to promote whatever you're working on, not just everything that you can do. So it's better that you have a very small marketing plan that's very effective than it is to do this huge scattershot of marketing in order to try to make anything work. He says in the end, and I firmly believe this, is that laziness becomes a mother of invention. I'm a person who has a full-time job. I don't have time during the day to, you know, think about how to promote my podcast as much as maybe someone who does this full-time. And when I get done with the day, I'm not necessarily looking for a lot of work at the end of my day. I enjoy making the podcast, but when it comes to marketing, I kind of get lazy about that too. And he says that the laziness is what causes you to create an effective marketing plan because you're trying to do a small amount of work that's effective instead of trying to do it all. So even if you're not doing marketing all the time, we can do marketing enough so that it is effective. He wants you to think about some definitions. You know, you have a bad idea when you talk about marketing. Somehow it's like you have a business. I have this podcast and now I have to market. And then you think, oh, it's horrible. And instead, he wants you to think of if a circus is coming to town and you paint a sign, circus coming to the showground on Sunday, that's advertising. If you put a sign on the back of an elephant and walk that elephant through town, that's called a promotion. And if a local newspaper then writes a story about the elephant walking through town, that's publicity. And if the mayor laughs about it, that's public relations. In the end, it's getting people to come to the circus. And the whole thing, that's all marketing. 
There's different strategies. There are just different tactics that you have that you want to incorporate in so that you can get a good marketing plan together. He says that the whole slogan from Bull Durham, if you build it, they will come, makes for a great movie and a terrible business strategy. If I just make a podcast, are people going to listen to me? I've had some very fortunate situations where I've had a friend who helped me, Allison at podfeet.com. And she's the one who helped me get this podcast off the ground. Without her, I would probably have three and a half people listening to my podcast. Having some sort of a friend help you is valuable. But then you have to take it where it's going to go next. He says that it's important that when you're looking at what you're going to do for marketing, that you have to have something that's trackable, something that's compelling, something that's targeted to a certain group of people, something that makes an offer to someone that they may want to say yes to, and then a call for a response. Then once you have some short-term follow-ups, you know, see how things are going with it, and then there's the maintenance follow-ups. It may be difficult when you're thinking about the podcast in itself because if I have a podcast and I'm trying to promote it, in essence, I'm going to create a challenge. Listen to my podcast. I'm going to help you make your world better every week. That's something that I can offer to people. When I have short-term follow-up, I can look at my statistics and see if the podcast is doing well. But In reality, I don't know all of you. I don't know your email address. And unless you email me and you tell me what you like or don't like about the podcast, I have really no good way of checking on you and seeing if you're still happy with this product. So this is a little bit different, I think, than if you were going to create a store and sell something. But it still had some pretty valuable advice for me, too. But I think the value of the advice is even better if you're planning on writing a book if you're planning on creating some kind of a store, something like that. And then he has what he calls his one-page marketing plan. And it is very simple. He first identifies who the target market is. He looks then at the message he's trying to send to his target market. How is he going to reach out and talk to the people who might be interested in that product? That's step one. And that's before you basically do your advertising. Then the next step is, is that you're my lead capture system. So during while you're finding leads for your product, my lead nurturing program. So how am I going to basically get people who might be on the edge, who might be thinking about shopping in my store? How do I get them to actually buy something in my store? And then the sales conversion strategy. How can I get them to actually click buy? And then after that interaction is done, How can I give them a great experience? How can I increase the value to my customers? And how can I get them to refer the product? That works really pretty good in podcasts because I hope that if you like this podcast, you tell someone else who might like this podcast. Word of mouth is one of the best ways to go when it comes to podcasts in general. But it also works if you're trying to do a store or you're trying to write a book and sell the book. Having a customer tell other potential customers that your project is great is just one of the best ways that you can do marketing just in general. Told you I work for a software company and one of the best marketing and really a lot of the marketing that goes on inside the software company itself, because it is specialized software, is a customer telling a potential customer, you have to buy that. So you really hope that you can get that referral. And that's the last step of it. The first step is to get them interested, try to get people curious about what it is you do. The part that's during the sale is get them to like you, like your store, and think about buying from you, he says, for the first time. And then after their customers, they've already signed on to them, how can you get the customer to trust you, to buy regularly from you, or refer new business to you? Think about that in when you're buying your own things. If you bought software, you know, maybe you're an artist and so you got some specific kind of software. I know I bought some software and it's funny. I love the software itself. I don't trust the company it comes from. And so I don't really refer them. It's the best graphic software for me, but I wouldn't tell you to buy it because I think that they have kind of a cheesy business model. So then I'm kind of stuck in that situation where I like it 
I buy it, and then I never tell anyone else to buy it either. I tell them to go investigate and try to find something else because I'm pretty sure that this company is going to try to nickel and dime me every chance it gets. And that's pretty annoying. So it met two of the three types of criteria when it comes to marketing. And if people aren't recommending the software, then you're pretty lost in getting new customers. So he said one of the biggest points about getting into marketing is to have a very narrow targeted audience. You don't want to say everyone. Everyone would do great if they bought my household cleaner. Now, if you're making a household cleaner, chances are you want everyone to buy it. But when you're coming into marketing, you're trying to write a marketing plan for a very specific user. Maybe it's a pet owner who has a big mess on their hands, or maybe it's people with a lot of children who have a messy house, they want to clean it up, and they don't have a lot of time on their hand. That's how you get to a particular group of people. So he says that you really want to focus on becoming a big fish, he says, in a small pond, because you're the best when it comes to cleaning a house when you're short on time and have a house full of kids or something like that. So he says that in order for any sort of marketing plan to be good, it has to be very targeted and even in this very small niche market. And this is because you don't have all the money in the world. You can't advertise to the whole world and say, my household cleaner is good for everybody. Everyone should buy that. You know, those are going to be the big name companies. But if you're a small business, which this book is primarily targeted to, you're not going to have that kind of attention. You want, he says, in the end, for someone to look at whatever type of advertising you're doing and say, hey, that's for me. And that's really interesting to try to make something more specialized. He said that if you do this jack of all trades kind of thing, it's not going to be as successful as you hope it will be. It kills you being special. Everyone can use this. Oh, well, then no one's really that interested in it. And it's hard to then dominate a particular category of customers, people who own pets. I know of certain sprays and cleaners out there that are geared toward pet owners, particularly smelly pet owners. And so they really want to clean up after their pet and make their house smell as fresh as possible. Those companies are well known and people will buy them, even though I suspect that their cleaners would work on any house, but they decided to go for a niche market. I think what's interesting, too, is that even when it comes into this podcast, when I started listening to other podcasts and reading other websites about how to create a podcast, they said the day of a generalized podcast are over, that it's better for you to go into a niche market and become the best podcast in that little tiny market. So instead of me, who does a podcast pretty much about any topic, that when it comes to getting unstuck in your life moving forward, getting your goals, it's a broad market. And it's probably not the direction this particular websites or even podcasts would suggest you go into because it's too broad. Instead, they would rather you say, I made a podcast for people who have ADD and it's specifically geared to this one kind of person helping them succeed. That's a better podcast in this day and age when we have so many podcasts than it is to be like mine, where I try to talk about all sorts of things. So then he wants you to look at basically how you can find value for your particular niche market and how can you make it profitable with your niche market. They give it a score. And his example was a photographer, but maybe if it'd be something like a podcast, that first you say, I'm going to do a podcast about model trains. Okay, the profit score is pretty low on that because no one's really going to buy model trains from me and they're going to be spending all their money on model trains. Then when it comes to personal fulfillment, maybe it gets a nine. So you multiply this low score three with the nine and you get a total score of 27. You try to figure out then where your best niche market is. So in my case, I say that when I do a podcast about everybody and everything, that it's a personal fulfillment of 10. That's who I really want to talk to. But when it comes to value in the marketplace, it's probably low because there's a lot of podcasts out there that talk about 
personal development and help for when you're being stuck. So the probably the profit level is low. But once you come in and you basically rate all the different kinds of customers you could have or kinds of businesses you could have, then that's when you're going to find out which one is sort of in that nice sweet spot. Is there a niche market you could go to that would make you happy? So in that particular case, you could be a corporate photographer, which had a low personal fulfillment, but a high profit level. Or if you had a wedding photographer, you might have a high personal value because you're getting to see weddings and a medium score profit level. And if you wanted to take pictures of pets and birds and all of that, maybe it's a personal fulfillment off the scales, but your profit margin is low because it's hard to sell art that is not targeted towards individuals. And so he wants you to go through all of that. And what I heard from various other people in looking at what kind of podcast to have is what really keeps you up at night, what makes you feel like you're on fire, what are your customers afraid of, what keeps them up at night, what are they upset about, what are their frustrations, what would really give you this audience so that you could help them get through this marketing plan. So what you're trying to do is once you figured out who your target audience is, you're trying to learn everything you can about that audience. You're trying to figure out what websites they go to, what books they like to read, what their fears and their triumphs are, and what are their emotions that they're feeling? Is there a lot of fear in your community? Or if they're model trainers, maybe there's a lot of excitement because it's a hobbyist type of event you're, you're marketing towards. So the next step is to learn everything you possibly can. He even says like a police sketch. You can create this avatar of who your target audience is. So my target audience is a person who's wondering what's next in their life, how they can overcome some of the things that haven't worked for them, and how can they grow past the point that they are right now. And you sort of build this avatar of the person so that you know who you're talking to, whether you're doing a podcast, you're writing a book, or you're starting a store. And then everything goes based on that avatar of your customer. How can you create a name and a logo that targets them? How can you be unique in that particular area? You know, he gives this example where he says, sometimes people just start a store and it says, I sell coffee and there's nothing unique about that. It's not going to get people burning to go to your store. It's not a good marketing plan either. And so then you're going to ask the question, once you're getting your marketing plan together, why should they come to me? Why won't they go to the next person or maybe not buy this product at all? And once you have this idea of your customer and where you're going with it, that's when you can create your elevator pitch. It's really important to have an elevator pitch. You know how many times I've been in a place and someone says, oh, you have a podcast. What's it about? Oh, well, it's about a, a lot of things. I talk about all sorts of different topics, I, you know, and then if you don't have the elevator speech, it's terrible and you don't really know how to describe what it is you're trying to do. I did on episode 19 about how to get an elevator speech. And so I highly recommend going back and listening to that because if you are going to sell a book, you are going to have a store or some kind of a thing, you should have an elevator pitch so you know exactly what it is. I think now that I've been talking to people about elevator pitches, it almost seems to me like everybody needs an elevator pitch. My friend works for a nonprofit organization. She has one. So if someone says, oh, well, what are you working on? She can say in a very concise way exactly what she's working on and why it's important. So I highly recommend that. You want to get good at writing this pitch, good at saying this pitch, and using emotional words. You don't want to drone on and be like Spock. You want to be passionate like Captain Kirk. You really want to go out and say these things that will really grab people. Always important, he says, quote, choose clarity over cleverness. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and I know that there are podcasts out there that have really clever names. And in listening to this other podcast that was talking about marketing, he called out this podcast because it had always a clever statement, which has absolutely nothing to do with what the topic of the podcast is. But it's clever and it's funny, and so maybe you'll listen to it because it sounds kind of a neat thing to do. Instead, they said, don't do that. Name your podcast 
exactly what it is. Even if it's boring by not being clever, you, people will at least know what it is you're talking about. So I've tried to do a better job of being clear about what each episode is about. And he says it's important that we do that because we're just buried in information. We're buried in ads. We may overlook things. We might get spammed. And so it's important that we have that very clear message that we're not trying to be too clever. And then he says it's important that when we get our plan in place, that we don't spam people. We don't drown them in information. I know we feel like if we're selling something, we have this very short time with them. And you try to gain as much information as possible. I, I was talking to a pastor once. He ended up saying almost two to three different sermons in every sermon he gave. And, and talking to him, it was that I have people in the chair once a week. I have to get my message out. I have to stuff them full of as much information as I can. And I thought about it and he gives so much information that sometimes I walk out of there not remembering any of it. It would be better if there was a simple message that I could remember and walk away with and enact. And that's where I think he's saying too. The other problem is, is that a lot of times when you sign up, and I sign up for a lot of mailing lists because a lot of these authors that are out there will give you a free booklet if you sign up to their website. And you get the PDF and it's good information. And I try to share some of it with you all. But then I'm on a mailing list, and it is funny how good and bad some of these authors are at this. Some of them will drown me in spam mail, buy this, do this, sign up for my class, do these things in a very short amount of time. And other people are very calm and like, hey, oh, by the way, I got this new course. You might be interested in it. Whatever. Here's some more information for you I thought you might like. When you have that balance of interacting with your potential customers and they learn to trust you, it's better than getting that quick message out where you make them wish they can find the unsubscribe even faster. You don't want to get into a place where the one thing that person is thinking about you is how do I unsubscribe from you? So I thought that was a valuable piece of advice. Then the next stop he talks about is what he calls the wantrepreneurs, which means that people who want to become an entrepreneur, want to become someone who's a content creator, but the wantrepreneurs are the content consumers. The one case, you're just reiterating the voice of your customer and maybe giving them good information. But when you become a content creator, you're actually becoming the voice of your tribe and giving value to them. And that's what is the important part. Think about this podcast. I'm going through and reading a lot of other people's books, a lot of other people's blogs, and relaying information to you about what they're saying are good ways of getting unstuck, of getting the things that you want in your life. None of it's my content. On occasion, I write my own podcast when I feel like I have a lot of experience in this particular area. But in the end, I don't have a book. I don't have something that I could go on another podcast and talk about other than my own you know, impressions about things. And so when reading this book, it showed me that my next step is that I need to come up with my own voice, whether that's me creating my own PDFs and then giving them to you, whether it's me creating my own content more often, or it's writing a book or something like that. How can I become more valuable to you by producing content instead of reviewing and talking about other people's content? So I thought that point seemed pretty valuable to me because I think it's a good step in becoming someone who helps other people in my community. If I can come up with something of value to you, I can become helpful and I can help you understand how to fix certain problems better. And then once you have that content in place, then people who are looking at your product will notice you. They'll think about you. They may even tell other people about you. Oh, you know, I was really stuck on how to lose weight. And I was reading dieting books, but instead I listened to Jill and she told me how I can create a plan that's a system so that it helps me lose weight. That way you're now talking about my podcast when maybe before if I'm reviewing other people's material, you're talking about James Clear's book. That's the whole message that came out to me. And so these are 
all great pieces of advice. The book goes on and talks more about how to get that marketing plan together and talking about getting cold prospects into customers, into fans, and how you can get that process to happen. I'm not going to cover the whole book. The whole point is just to give you sort of an introduction about what this book is about. And if you're someone who's looking to do a very simple marketing plan, want some good ideas about how to market whatever it is you're thinking about, this particular book is a good start in how to do that. A lot of times when you look at marketing plan books, they almost have you start writing an entire binder full of a plan. And if your business is small, it's very focused, you're starting out with not very much money and to do it, then I think that this book is a particularly good way to start. So my challenge to you is to start on his one-page marketing plan. And if you're going to write a book, you're going to have a small business, or maybe you work for a nonprofit organization you wish more people knew about, start off with his beginning plan, which is figure out who your target audience is. And then try to figure out what message you have for them and what makes them tick. What books do they read? What are their worries at night? What makes them joyful? And try to become the expert of your own tribe. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. And so please remember to always subscribe to the podcast, leave a review. See, there's my marketing right there or tell a friend. I really want this podcast to grow. I hope it helps people take that next step. And until I have content where I can go and become James Clear, I'm going to have to start here with small steps. 